What the fuck is up? Welcome back. My name is Noah Hills. You can catch me on Twitter at Noah More Parties. And in today's video, I want to talk about one of the kind of one of the most controversial running backs in this in this rookie class. Everybody likes him, you know, in some ways. Most people have some questions about um, some of the flaws in his profile. So I want to dive into some of like the main arguments surrounding Kenneth Walker, see if I can work through them and come to some sort of conclusion by the end of this video. So let's dive into it. First of all, there should be no question about Kenneth Walker's ability to run the football. He is the best pure runner in this class and one of the best pure runners we've seen come out in a long time. Like he had high level volume. He saw heavy box counts relative to the rest of the guys at Michigan State and Wake Forest and was way more efficient than them anyway. He averaged 1.5 yards per carry greater than his teammates. He was ripping off 10 yard runs at a 5% greater clip than they were. Given the box counts he was seeing, the average Kenneth Walker carry was worth 146% the output of the average carry for all non-Kenneth Walker runners on his teams. He was succeeding on his carries 9% more often than the other guys on his team. Those are both in the 91st percentile. He was incredible in the open field, converting 40% of his 10-yard runs into 20-yard runs. That's in the 89th percentile, and he was a great tackle breaker. Uh, 98th percentile, missed tackles forced per attempt. And given his size, 5'9", 211, he ran 4.38. Given his athletic profile, given his size, given these rushing efficiency metrics, the guys who are like most similar to him from like a pure runner standpoint are Javon Ringer, D'Angelo Williams, Travis Etienne, Ryan Matthews, Maurice Jones-Drew, Lamar Miller. Classic, pure runners, good players. That's not the question about Kenneth Walker. The question about Kenneth Walker is that he was not a productive receiver in college at all. He had 19 total receptions. He averaged 7.1 receptions per 12 games, so essentially per season, which is a like per game receiving output in the 13th percentile. And even adjusted for like how little Michigan State threw the ball, he had a 5.4% target share which is in the 15th percentile. He wasn't just like kind of uninvolved. He was like historically not involved as a receiver, especially given the size of his role where he had like a 37% dominator rating and and was one of the most like overall productive running backs in the entire country. For that guy to not be involved in the receiving game is pretty rare. So I want to kind of like dissect a lot of the arguments surrounding like why we should be optimistic about Kenneth Walker's receiving, you know, potential in the NFL, despite him not having been a productive receiver in college. And uh, one of them that I've seen is that his role was just maxed out. Like there wasn't room in the offense in Kenneth Walker's role for him to contribute as a receiver. So I kind of like dove into that a little bit. And since 2006, there have been 130 running backs drafted who averaged more carries per game in their careers than Kenneth Walker did in college. Of those 130 guys, only 13 of them had lower target share numbers than Kenneth Walker did. And only seven of them averaged fewer receptions per game than Kenneth Walker did in college. So among all of these guys who every single one of them, all 130 of them averaged more carries per game than Kenneth Walker did. So larger workloads, 5% of them in target share and receptions per game were less involved than Kenneth Walker was. So, you know, was his role maxed out or was he specifically just not used as a receiver? And then there are 14 running backs drafted since 2006 who averaged more carries per game for their careers than Walker did in his final season. Like, Walker's final year was really the only year where he had, like, a large workload. He had, I don't even think he had 120 carries in his, you know, highest volume season at Wake Forest. Came to Michigan State, had, like, 263 carries last season, I I believe. So, among guys who averaged at least 263 carries per 12 games for their entire careers, none of them had lower target shares, and none of them had fewer receptions per game than Kenneth Walker did in college. His role was not maxed out. He specifically was just not used as a receiver. We've seen guys who have roles like his, at least high volume rushing roles, for their careers, for single seasons. Walker is still historically uninvolved as a receiver given his role. Another argument I've seen is that Michigan State just didn't throw to the running backs, which, you know, that would be a fairly compelling argument if it's true, and I don't think it's false. Kenneth Walker also played at Wake Forest for two years, and he wasn't involved as a receiver there. He had six receptions in 20 games at Wake Forest, with target shares of 1.2% and 1.5%. And, like, his overall role in the offense at Wake Forest was fairly small, but he wasn't involved even given the size of his role. For running backs drafted since 2006, receptions make up 9.9% of their total touches. So, essentially 10% of their total touches are receptions. 
Walker's receptions in college made up less than 4% of his total touches. And for running backs drafted since 2006, their target share is generally about a third of their dominator rating. So if you have a 30% dominator rating, you're likely to have about a 10% target share, like on average. If you have a 45% dominator rating, you're likely to have a 15% target share on average. Walker's target share was less than one-sixth of his dominator rating. So even adjusted for the size of his role, he wasn't involved as a receiver, and it could be true that Michigan State didn't throw to their running backs, but given that he also wasn't involved at Wake Forest, maybe they didn't throw to their running backs either, but it becomes harder to justify a team like not utilizing a guy in an area where he's like supposedly secretly good when it happened at two different programs. If he spent his entire career at Michigan State and they just happened to not use their running backs in the passing game, that's a little bit better argument. But like, we've seen him play at two different programs and if this guy's a good receiver, there were zero coaches at either of those schools who were like, oh man, we should probably throw this guy the ball. That's not really a good sign. But maybe it's true. Maybe it's true that Kenneth Walker was not involved as a receiver simply because the teams he was on didn't throw to running backs. If that's the case, and if he's actually a good receiver despite that, we'd expect him to be efficient on low volume. And he just wasn't. With a an average depth of target of negative 0.7, so behind the line of scrimmage, that's 28th percentile, Kenneth Walker had a catch rate of 61.3%, which is in the 4th percentile. It's the worst in the entire running back class of 2022. And out of 222 running backs who I have catch rate numbers for, running back prospects, he ranks 217th out of 222 in catch rate. He averaged 4.6 yards per target, which is in the 15th percentile, and his best efficiency metric as a receiver was yards after the catch per reception of 9.8, a 58th percentile mark that really just speaks to how he, you know, is playing with the ball in his hands. An argument that I've seen, you know, kind of as a retort to this, that he, you know, he should be efficient if we expect him to be good, even though he was low volume, is that his quarterback was just like bad, inaccurate, not good. And the quarterback for Michigan State last year was Peyton Thorne, who like, it's true, he's not good, but I kind of wanted to look into it. Like, is he, like, especially bad in such a way that we should, you know, be making exceptions for Kenneth Walker because, like, his quarterback was uniquely terrible? And I don't think that's really the case. Like, Peyton Thorne wasn't historically bad last year. His completion percentage was 7 out of 14 quarterbacks in the Big Ten. His yards per attempt was 4th out of 14 quarterbacks in the Big Ten. His passer rating, was 5th out of 14 quarterbacks in the Big Ten, and 46th out of 110 quarterbacks in the country who threw at least 200 passes last season. The argument here is not that Peyton Thorne was good. Like, he he's not. He's, at best, an average quarterback, an average college quarterback, probably not even anything close to an NFL prospect. But it's not like he was throwing it in the dirt every play. He was average. Why are we making quarterback-related excuses for Kenneth Walker's low efficiency when his quarterback was not uniquely bad relative to every other quarterback in college football. That doesn't really make sense to me. But if we want to account for that anyway, and we say, okay, Peyton Thorne was causing Kenneth Walker to be, like, inefficient as a receiver, he was, you know, sailing passes, he was throwing them in the dirt, he was, you know, whatever it was that wasn't allowing Kenneth Walker a fair chance on his targets, we could look at true catch rate, which filters out all targets that are uncatchable, just looks at catchable targets, how did a running back do there? Kenneth Walker's true catch rate was 86.4%, which is much better than 61.3%, but that still ranks, you know, he's no longer worse than the class. He's now 26th out of 38 running backs in this class, which is still below average, still not good. And that's a lower true catch rate on the same types of easy targets, like he's catching the ball behind the line of scrimmage, lower catch rate on the same easy targets as guys like Tyler Algier, Jalen Warren, Kennedy Brooks, and Abram Smith. Walker caught fewer passes in college than all of those guys did. So if like we're making this argument that he's actually an effective pass catcher in the face of like low volume and bad quarterback play, if you're making that argument for Kenneth Walker, you need to be keeping the same energy with guys like Jalen Warren, Kennedy Brooks, and Abram Smith. And I see nobody arguing in favor of them as like low key good receivers, you know, as we project them to the NFL. The argument is being made for Walker because people like Walker as a runner. And so they're finding ways to justify why he should be a good receiver in the NFL when like that argument equally applies to these other guys that people don't like and that it just doesn't make any sense. And, you know, I kind of imagine like this argument about, well, he was just lightly used, like we we don't know that he can't do it. He just wasn't asked to. Like imagine if the situation was reversed. Imagine 
a running back prospect who was like a super dynamic, super efficient, like receiving back, like super dynamic satellite back. He caught like 500 passes in college, but he wasn't used as a runner, like hardly at all. That wasn't his role. He only ran the ball 26 times in college. So this uber efficient receiver, one of the best receiving running backs we've ever seen come out of college, barely ever touched the ball on the ground. Imagine if we're arguing like whether or not this guy can be a good enough runner to be a three down back in the NFL. And the go-to argument for him is we shouldn't assume he can't do it just because he was wasn't asked to. Like, just because he didn't run the ball a lot doesn't mean he can't run the ball, which isn't necessarily false. But then imagine that that guy averaged 3.2 yards per carry and was the least efficient runner in his entire draft class on his 26 carries. That's the argument you're making for Kenneth Walker as a receiver. Yeah, he wasn't really asked to do it, but B, he wasn't good in the few times he was asked to do it, which does not mean that he's automatically bad, but nihilism is not helpful when evaluating prospects. We can't pretend that he's good at something that he didn't do a lot in college and was bad when he did it the few times he did do it. And also, if your argument could equally be applied to every player who didn't do thing X in college, then it's meaningless. Like, there are lots of running backs who didn't catch a lot of passes in college. If you're going to say that, like, Kenneth Walker should be a fine receiver in the, in the NFL because, you know, we can't say he's bad just because he didn't do it, that statement equally applies to literally every single running back who wasn't a productive receiver in college. And, like, we, we could take that logic in ridiculous places. Like, it's not that Brees Hall couldn't be a great quarterback. He just wasn't asked to play that role in college. Like, that argument isn't technically incorrect, but it's ridiculous. It means nothing. And obviously that's hyperbole, but it's the same logic just applied to a more extreme case. There's no difference in the logic there. You could apply that to almost anything. Like my uncle Bill could hypothetically be the best president the United States has ever seen. He just, you know, hasn't had the chance. That's not a reason to elect him. There's no reason to think he would be a good president. The absence of him doing something is not evidence that he could hypothetically do it. That's, that's a terrible argument. I don't think that argument is compelling. Another argument I've seen for Kenneth Walker is that he was smooth catching passes at the Combine and his Pro Day, which, you know, that I think that's an objectively good thing. It's certainly not bad, but he's an elite athlete. He's soon to be a professional athlete. If the threshold for guys who we can expect to, like, be, you know, decent to good receivers in the NFL is just, like, if that threshold is just not falling over themselves and, like, dropping passes while running routes against air at the Combine, then... Like, we're not eliminating anybody. Jordan Howard can do that. Derrick Henry can do that. Like, Kalen Balaj can do that. And th these guys are not good receivers at running back in the NFL. Like, just because a guy, you know, could, like, navigate his way around a cone and catch the ball without dropping it with zero defense is not really an indication that he should be, like, some, you know, guy that we can assume is going to be good in the NFL. Another argument I've seen is that Kenneth Walker was a productive receiver in high school. And this is one of the most compelling arguments I've seen because it shows that he, you know, maybe was able to do something that he just didn't have the opportunity to do in college. And on Twitter, you know, you, you could search it up, Kenneth Walker High School, and you'll see lots of people jumping in different people's mentions with like this 64 receptions, 1,058 yards, and 16 receiving touchdowns line that Kenneth Walker had in high school in 30 games, which sounds good. Like 64 receptions, 1,000 yards, 16 touchdowns, that seems like, you know, good production as a receiver. The problem with this argument is that we have no context for what these numbers mean. Like, what was the level of competition? Uh, what did historical, you know, running back prospects do in high school? We have no idea. I don't know if 64, 1016 is a 90th percentile, like, receiving production line, if that's 10th percentile. I have no idea. It's like if you, you know, if I stumbled across, like, a Wikipedia page for, like, a, a cricket player and saw that he, like, Bolly whopped 87 bisky wickets in three games or three matches, whatever the fuck. Like, 87 sounds like a high number, but I don't have any idea how cricket works. Like, I don't know if that's good. I don't know what those numbers mean in the context of high school football, and I especially don't know what they mean in the context of what other historical running back prospects did in high school. Like, we know that Kenneth Walker's 19 career receptions is low because we have other players to compare it to. And as far as I know, like, none of the people pumping up Kenneth Walker's high school receiving numbers are doing so in the context of everybody else's high school receiving numbers, and so it's a little bit hard to, like, draw strong conclusions from that line, even though it sounds good and would potentially be compelling with context. Another argument I've seen in favor of Kenneth Walker as a receiver is that guys like Jonathan Taylor, Melvin Gordon, and A.J. Dillon didn't catch passes in college either. And... I don't think the argument is very good in drawing 
a comparison between Walker and any of those guys. Jonathan Taylor had twice as many receptions, more than twice as many receptions as Kenneth Walker did in every season he played in college. He had twice, more than twice as many as a freshman, more than twice as many as a sophomore. I think exactly twice as many as a junior. He had a 10.5% target share to Kenneth Walker's 5.4% target share. He averaged 6.1 yards per target, which isn't great, but to Kenneth Walker's 4.6 yards per target. And he had an dot of two yards downfield relative to Kenneth Walker's dot of negative 0.7 yards backwards. So he was catching more advanced passes more often and with a higher share of his team's passing offense, and he was more efficient. So Jonathan Taylor is a terrible comparison for Kenneth Walker. Please stop making that argument if you're doing that. You you just look dumb. Melvin Gordon had an 8.1% target share in his, you know, most productive receiving season. Again, Kenneth Walker's was 5.4%. He had 19 receptions in his final season, which is equal to what Kenneth Walker had in his entire career. Like, people throw around this 20 receptions threshold for like, oh, yep, this guy caught 20 passes in college in a season. Like, check, he's a good pass catcher. Melvin Gordon was one shy of that. Like, the 20 reception threshold is not my threshold. I'm not using that. But there are people who do. And how, I don't know how, you know, the analytics people can claim, like, 20 is a box checked. Melvin Gordon wasn't heavily used as a receiver in college when he had 19 in his final season. Like, come on. A.J. Dillon is probably the best example here. Uh, He had a 6.4% target share to Kenneth Walker's 5.4, and so that's higher. He caught two more passes in college than Kenneth Walker did, but he had 10.8 yards per target, which is in the 91st percentile. He was incredibly efficient on limited work, and let me scroll back up here. Kenneth Walker had, what was it, 4.6 yards per target on his limited work, so A.J. Dillon was more than twice as efficient on essentially the same receiving volume as Kenneth Walker was, that's not a great comparison either. Like, the point for Kenneth Walker is, yeah, he was low volume, but supposedly good, so like, you know, hypothetically, he should be efficient. He wasn't. A.J. Dillon does satisfy that part of the argument. And the other thing is that none of these guys were undersized. Melvin Gordon was, what, like 218 pounds? A.J. Dillon's like 240. Jonathan Taylor's close to 230. Kenneth Walker was 5'9" and a quarter, and 211 pounds at the combine, and then he weighed in at 209 at his pro day. He's not comparable to those guys from a size perspective, and given that we want our running backs to, like, be able to get on the field in the NFL, if you can't catch passes, you need to be big, because you need to be able to play on first and second down then. And if you aren't big, you need to catch passes so you can play on third down. Kenneth Walker doesn't really satisfy either of those requirements as a a historically inefficient and uninvolved receiver and an undersized running back. Those other guys that we're claiming are similar to Kenneth Walker as college receivers, Taylor, Gordon, Dylan, you know, some of these other guys, don't have the size issue that Kenneth Walker has on top of the receiving issue. And if he doesn't develop as a receiver, the odds that Kenneth Walker is a high-level fantasy producer are pretty low. In the last five years, the RB12 in PPR has averaged around 15 points per game. That's actually around what the RB14 has averaged, but let's say that 15 points per game is about what we would expect from, like, a low-end RB1. Since the turn of the century, since the year 2000, the only sub-215-pound running backs who have posted an RB1-level season— you know, at least 15 points per game, while averaging fewer than two receptions per game, are D'Angelo Williams, Willie Parker, and Elijah Mitchell. That's three guys in the last 21 years. D'Angelo Williams is 5'9", 214 pounds. Willie Parker was 5'10", and 212 pounds. And Elijah Mitchell weighed in at the combine at 5'10", and 200 pounds. Although... The stands claim he's actually like 220 pounds. And so if we're going to, you know, say he's 220, there's even less historical precedent for a small non-receiver to be a productive fantasy guy in the NFL. I actually think the best you know, with the cleanest comp for Kenneth Walker is Julius Jones. You know, a guy who played uh, for the Cowboys back in the, you know, mid-2000s. He was 5'9 and 217 pounds at the Combine, so he had decent size there. But per pro football reference, he actually, you know, was listed at 208 pounds. So if that weight is to be trusted, he was about the same size as Kenneth Walker. He had 446 speed at the Combine, 70th percentile burst score, 78th percentile agility score, so plus athlete, just like Kenneth Walker was. And in college, Julius Jones averaged 0.62 receptions per game. Kenneth Walker averaged 0.59. Julius Jones's college target share was 5.5%. Walker's was 5.4. Julius Jones averaged 2.07 yards per carry greater than the other guys at Notre Dame. Walker averaged 1.5 yards per carry greater than the other guys at Wake Forest and Michigan State. Julius Jones's top dominator rating in college was 38%. 
Kenneth Walker's was 37. Julius Jones broke out at age 20. Kenneth Walker broke out at age 19.9. These are very equivalent prospects. Julius Jones went on to struggle with injuries in the NFL a little bit, but through his first three seasons, he had a 17-game pace of 1,300 rushing yards, seven touchdowns, and 28 receptions, you know, like in a 17-game season. That would be pretty solid for Kenneth Walker, and I think this is a, a, a pretty good, like, equivalence to draw between, like, an historical prospect who is very similar, who ended up being successful in the NFL despite dealing with injuries. Kenneth Walker could be that kind of guy. And I think overall, there's a lot of risk involved in like the undersized non-receiver archetype that Kenneth Walker belongs to. Like other quality prospects, really good college players that we've seen come out in recent years in that archetype are like Ronald Jones, Chuba Hubbard, Bryce Love, Bilal Powell, LaMichael James, Tevin Coleman. It's easy to look at that group and be like, yeah, but those guys aren't good. Kenneth Walker is. Like, why would we compare them to him? But like, Ronald Jones was a second round pick. That's where we expect Kenneth Walker to go. LaMichael James was a second round pick. Tevin Coleman was picked in the third round. Chuba Hubbard and Bryce Love were both Heisman candidates before, you know, having down seasons in their final college years that caused them to like drop in the draft a little bit. But even they were taken in the fourth round. Bilal Powell was a fourth round pick. These guys were really good prospects who were undersized backs, who didn't catch many passes, but were really good runners in college. They're the same type of guy that Kenneth Walker is now. And I do think that Kenneth Walker is the best runner among them, but I'm not really confident he'll ever be a quality receiver in the NFL. I, I recently looked into it, and 61% of running back targets in the NFL came on screen passes, passes to the flat, or check and release routes where a guy is like, you know, blocking or looking to block and then you know, releasing out into the flat or whatever. These are fairly basic routes. Like, they're all within, you know, basically right at or behind the line of scrimmage. So it's not like Kenneth Walker has to be Alvin Kamara. He doesn't need to line up in the slot and, like, beat, beat a linebacker one-on-one -on -one and, you know, you know, go up the sideline and catch a jump ball. He doesn't have to do those things. He just has to be able to, you know, like, swing out, catch a swing pass, make something happen, you know, position himself well on the screen, collect the ball cleanly, make something happen after the catch. But those are the kinds of things he was being asked to do in college, and he wasn't good at them. Like, I'm not confident that a guy who was lightly used and wasn't efficient in college is going to go to the NFL and suddenly be good. It's also not good that Kenneth Walker's cleanest comps are a guy in Julius Jones, who came into the NFL 18 years ago, and Willie Parker, who came into the NFL 18 years ago, and D'Angelo Williams, who came to the NFL 16 years ago. Like, we're going back 20 years and finding only like three or four successful examples of guys with this profile who produce well in the NFL. All of that said, I think Kenneth Walker is just big enough to be like a high volume two down back, even if he doesn't develop as a receiver, which I'm not optimistic about. Given that I think he barely has the size, given that I think he's one of the best pure runners we've really ever seen come out of college football in recent history, I'm in at cost right now. Like, my mind might change even by the time this video comes out later this week, but I've been like tossing back and forth in my head with this like for months now. I don't believe we can confidently say that he like be a fine receiver in the NFL, but I do think that he's good enough as a runner and just big enough that we should expect him to be a productive two down back in the NFL. He should be like a Julius Jones type producer, maybe a Willie Parker type producer. I think this is like his range of outcomes. There's the risk that he just never quite puts it together like those Ronald Jones and Tevin Coleman types, but the upside represented by his ability to run the ball effectively, if he's in the right situation and an NFL team feeds him, it's wheels up for Kenneth Walker, even if he's not a good receiver, I think I'm in. <laughs> Yeah.